while they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they saw a ghost. He said to them, Why are you troubled, and why do doubt rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones. As you see, I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while, there, while they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, they asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of the broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. He said to them, This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, This is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. I am going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from, the, from on high. When he had read them out to the vicinity of the Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at temple praising God. Love God. Love your neighbor. The title of my message is The Forgiveness of Sins Will Be Preached to All Nations. Key verses 47. There are two conflicting worldviews today. So you, you either believe that you can change a society, and then it will change man. But all you believe that you change man on the inside, and then they will change a society. So these are two opposing views, world views. The second is the Christian view. And the inner change comes from the forgiveness of sins. So we have only one message, the forgiveness of sins. So why is it important? to believe that Jesus died and rose again on the third day? Why is it important to believe that he is the Son of God? Why is it important to believe that he is the Messiah, the Savior of the world? Because the only thing that changes a man is the forgiveness of sins, and that forgiveness of sins comes through Jesus' death and resurrection. So the Christian gospel is this. God is merciful and God will forgive your sins if you come and repent. And that provision is in Christ. So that's the way it started in Luke's gospel. And that's the way it ends. So remember in chapter 3, when John the Baptist came along, he, he preached the message of repentance. He went around all the Jordan, around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And in this last chapter, Jesus told his disciples to preach the forgiveness of sins. So that's the only message, our only message. We don't have a philosophical message. We don't have economical message. We don't have an educational message. We have only one message, the forgiveness of sins. Remember in Acts chapter 10, there is a story of Cornelius, Roman centurion. Cornelius was an upright man who pleased God by his generous giving to the poor. Yet God asks him to call Peter and to listen to the message of Jesus because he needed the forgiveness of sins. So Acts chapter 10, verse 43, Peter said, 
all the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives the forgiveness of sins through his name. So first, peace be with you. Last week, through Jacob's message, we learned that Jesus was raised from the dead on the third day. The reason Jesus helped the women from mourning into dancing because of hope and joy. The reason Jesus helped the two disciples who are running away to Emmaus to overcome their despair. When they met the risen Jesus, their hearts were burning within them with a glorious hope. Their dead hearts became alive again. They came back to Jerusalem immediately and told 11 how the risen Jesus met them. Look at verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. The disciples were not really experiencing peace at the moment. They were hiding behind the locked doors for fear of the Jewish leaders. They were startled and frightened, thinking that they saw a ghost. I mean, their fear is understandable, as everything they hoped and expected fell apart. Jesus rebuked them. Why are you tr troubled and why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. A ghost does not have a flesh and bones as you see I have. So Jesus showed his nailed marks in his hands. And they really realized it is really Jesus. While they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate it in their presence. The reason Jesus did not ask them to suspend or overcome their doubts, but help them to touch and see, even, even eating a piece of broiled fish, that they may know for certain that he has indeed risen from the dead. The doctrine of bodily resurrection is the essential in a Christian faith. Everything hangs on it. It proves that this is the same Jesus who died for our sins and is now risen to life. It proves that death could not keep its hold on him, and death is a defeated foe. This gives us the real foundation of, for peace with God. But if Jesus had remained dead, we may wonder, maybe not everything could be paid for by Jesus' blood. Perhaps only a portion. But since justice has, has been fully met, there is no more debt, no more wages, no more sins to be paid. The bodily resurrection of Jesus proves that all our sins have been paid. And this gives us a peace with God. Just as Jesus' body was real and tangible, so our hope is secure. Jesus does not want our hope to be vague or wishful thinking, but tangible and real. As always, Jesus leads the way. We too can look forward to the glorious resurrection body. In view of that, our bodies are seed for the resurrection body. And we look forward to the new body as we look forward to the new heaven and new earth. So this gives us a powerful and tangible peace, a hope that endures forever. Since the Sunday in 30 AD, the triumphant cry of the church has been, the Lord Jesus is alive. He is risen from the dead. This is the invincibility of the church. And this is what the church has been always preached. He rose from the dead. So on the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up and said, You killed him, but God raised him. In Acts chapter 3, you killed him, God raised him. In Acts chapter 4, you killed him, and God raised him. In Acts chapter 5, you killed him, God raised him. In Acts chapter 10, 
42 through 42, God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God has already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one God, whom God appointed as the judge of the living and the dead. Our Lord Jesus have gone to heaven without a body. He had been in heaven for all eternity without body. He could have gone back without one and still been glorious, still been who he was. So the resurrection is not a continued about his continued existence. There was, that was never in question. He's eternal. So then why? then bodily resurrection. Why bodily resurrection is necessary? So let me give you two reasons. Firstly, a bodily resurrection was necessary to demonstrate his complete victory over sin. Sin kills both body and soul. Sin brought spiritual death and it brought physical death. If you only conquer the spiritual side, then he did not conquer sin completely. The wages of sin is both physical and spiritual death. And Jesus needed to conquer both. If Christ has only conquered spiritual death, it would have been less than a complete victory. If he had not risen bodily, we would not rise from the dead either. Bodily resurrection is necessary to make the triumph over sin complete. And secondly, the more importantly, the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is visible proof that God was satisfied with his sacrifice. It does matter that his body comes out of the grave. Because how else do we know that God was satisfied with his sacrifice? Because we, we do not see his spirit. Faith comes. Saving faith comes when he acknowledge Jesus as Lord. And we know that God raised him from the dead who put the divine stamp of approval on his walk on the cross. Jesus' disciples followed him to the cross. And then between Friday and Sunday, all ran away. If, you, if all you do is to follow Jesus to the cross, you are going to have all your hopes shattered. They need to know that not only did he die, but he's alive. And the only way they would know that is to see him in the physical, visible, tangible, and touchable form. If they had never seen Jesus alive from the dead, and if his body was in the grave somewhere, they would never carry the message any further. They have gone to emails or every other, every other village dispersed all the way back to where they came from. And they would have said, there is no reason to go a step further. They would never have attempted to make a convert, establish a religion based on a dead, disappointing leader, even though they loved him. So what changed them was that they saw him alive. No one would have believed that the Lord Jesus was the Savior, the Son of God and Lord, if Jesus had not visibly risen from the dead. That's why Paul argues logically in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. You know, the Greek philosophers thought that the body is the prison of the soul and body is evil. But they were wrong. Plato was wrong, Aristotle was wrong, and all who follow them were wrong. The body is not the prison of the spirit. The body is essential to what it means to be a human. In its glorified form, will be both body and spirit in heaven. 
exalting Christ forever. Most importantly, we'll be like Him. Someone joked that our resurrection body will have a mouth, but will not have a bottom. Because the Bible says that we'll have a feast in God's kingdom, so we'll eat. But going to a bathroom sounds so repulsive. <laughs> Is that what you think? You know, our resurrection body will be totally different. We should not think of it as in terms of physical body. Our resurrection body will be like a glorious. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 says, And just as we have borne the image of the earthly man, so shall we bear the image of the heavenly man. Uh, second, the repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. Look at verses 46 and 47. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is Luke's gospel version of the Great Commission. Jesus had the vision that the gospel will be preached to all nations. Jesus' vision is the very plan of God. Jesus fulfilled the first part of this vision as the Messiah by his suffering and resurrection. And the Bible talks about this work all throughout the Bible. But Jesus' vision did not end with his completed work. Do you see the end, the word end? Using the word end, Jesus connects the gospel ministry, the, work, the thing we do, the preaching the gospel as part of his gospel. The gospel message extends all time and space, including the time after Jesus' ascension. And it will continue until Jesus comes again as a King of kings and Lord of lords. So we need many things. But what we need most is the forgiveness of sins. We understand why in many ways, but simply speaking, we are under God's wrath because of sin. We suffer wages of sin, such as guilt, fear, and shame. And these have shaped our character, our society, and in culture in many ways. The trouble is, there is no solution to this problem. Education, money, or democracy will cannot solve this problem. We try to treat it through a temporary measure to find peace, like a pleasures, ambition, hard work, or many ways. But nothing really works. What is worse, our pride tells us that we can do it alone. But Jesus accomplished for us the way of salvation on the cross. So the way to receive this is not complicated. It's simply, we just simply come to God and repent. Come back and follow God's way. Then we receive the forgiveness of sins. The forgiveness of sins is transformational. When you are forgiven, it is the most transforming act that God can do. He moves you from death to life, damnation to no condemnation. He moves you from hell to heaven. He moves you from being an enemy to becoming a friend. He moves you from a son of wrath to a son of God. He moves you from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of God's dear son, the kingdom of light. He moves you from being under the authority of Satan to being under the authority of God. He transforms you in every way. So within this great act of forgiveness come all the elements of salvation including justification, sanctification, redemption, and adoption. All of those are elements of salvation, but salvation at its core is the forgiveness of sins, which then eliminates the penalty of sin. But it's not just the elimination of the penalty, it is a transformation of the person now and forever into a person that longs for what is righteous. 
This is a great transforming reality. When a person's sins are forgiven, they are a new creation. So that's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. Look at verse 48. You are witnesses of these things. Jesus did not say, you are responsible to do all this by yourself. He said, you are witnesses. This simply means the state of truth as we know it. But the disciples did so with such a commitment, even to the point of death, that we get, the, we get our word martyr from the word translated witness. To the disciples, the gospel was not work to, work to be done, but a truth be told and lived. They had this vision in their minds, and it fueled their daily choices. They saw beyond themselves. They found their place in Jesus' worldwide vision. And this compelled them to live passionately for the gospel, for Jesus. And in their, and in their time, they shook the world with this message of forgiveness. So if we have come to believe in Jesus, if our minds have been opened to the scriptures, we too are witnesses of these things. But Jesus did not leave us helpless, but empowers us with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 49. I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in this city until you have been clothed with the power from on high. We pray for revival today. And from this passage, we learn that the revival begins with seeing my place with, in God's glorious vision and then obeying by the power of God. Revival begins with me. Look at verses 50 through 53. When he had led them out to the vicinity of Bethany, he lifted up his hands and blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up into heaven. Then they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy. And they stayed continually at the temple praising God. With his peace and vision from the risen Christ, the disciples found a clear life direction. Their passion for life was restored. The same Jesus who ascended will return in the same way. This is our hope. They worship Jesus as God. They return to Jerusalem obedient to the words Jesus gave them. And waiting for what the Father has promised. And they were filled with joy. Remember, in chapter 1, Luke's Gospel opened with the devout believers. Uh, at the temple, praying for the Messiah. Now Luke's gospel closes at the same place with the devout believers praising God for answer the prayer. So we gathered here today to worship the risen Christ. We praise him for what he had done. He commands us to preach the message of forgiveness of sins. And he has a vision that this message of forgiveness of sins will be preached to all nations. So I pray that each of us may have this Jesus vision today.